In this video, I discuss three basic money rules that every retiree needs to know. Coming up next on Holy Schmidt. Holy Schmidt! If you put the term money rules with quotes around it in your favorite search engine, what comes back is 450,000 plus listings. It's no wonder people are confused about what to do with their money in retirement. I'm here to help. This video will discuss what I consider to be the three most important elements, the three basic elements for money when it comes to a retiree. Let's jump right into it. But before we begin, you see on the screen here that I have the URL for my free retirement ready checklist. I've had a lot of people that have downloaded this checklist. It's quite useful and I'm really proud of it. It's something that I have given away for the better part of a year and I want to switch to something else unrelated to a checklist, a retirement ready checklist anyway. So if this is something of interest to you, make sure you go to my website soon, holyschmidt.com forward slash checklist to get your free copy. I'm also excited about my next free giveaway, but you can have two of something that's nice instead of one. All right, let's go. Point number one is engaging in efficient spending. Now, I just want to take a moment and discuss the difference between efficient spending and effective spending because they are completely different and a lot of people get these two things confused and this can be very, very dangerous. In most years, most stores have 50% off sales. These are our sales to clear the inventory and get the cash flow so that they can redeploy it in the year ahead. Oftentimes it happens right after December 25th. You can look in the newspaper or online and see a December 26th sale at retailers, particularly clothes retailers. And by the way, the same thing happens in midsummer around July. So it's not a one time a year thing. It's usually a twice a year thing. If you walked into that store and you bought one item and you bought it at 50% off, that would be a very efficient purchase because you bought something that was inexpensive. You got exactly what you needed and you walked out the door. However, what often happens is that people will go in and they'll buy a lot of different things. That's, that's what the store wants you to do. Let's change the fact pattern a bit. Instead of walking into the 50% sale and buying one item, you walk in and you buy a lot of different items because everything is 50% off. Shirts, shoes, pants, blazers, everything. You might not have needed all of it, but you could and would use it. So therefore, that type of purchase was effective, but it wasn't efficient because you didn't need it. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about how to maximize efficiency. The first thing is don't buy what you don't need, of course, exactly what I just said a moment ago. Even if you could use it, if you're not going to or you don't need it, then don't buy it. The second point is to maximize every discount available to you. The 50% off sale is nice, but a 50% off sale combined with a 25% off coupon is even better, for example. The third point in maximizing efficiency is really understanding whose back that monkey belongs on. Let me explain. When you pay for something in your life, a lot of times you aren't actually responsible for making that payment, but you do it because you feel like you need to, or you feel like it would be the right thing to do. But oftentimes there's not an expectation that you should or would pay for the item or the event in question. A typical example is the family dinner. When the kids are growing up, there's an expectation that mom or dad will pay for everything. And that's a reasonable expectation, particularly if the children are young. As they approach their mid to late teens and they get a part-time job, it might be okay to let them pay for a few things so that they learn how to be self-sufficient. But by and large, when the kids are growing up, it's mom and dad's responsibility to cover the big costs. Now what happens in your own retirement? And your son or your daughter, who's now a doctor or a lawyer or a professional of some sort, has dinner with you. Is the expectation that you're going to pay? How come? At some point, it makes very little sense for you to be picking up the bill when their income is twice what your retirement cash flow is, or three or four times in some cases, especially today. Take that same example and think about if you belong to a housing association or a cul-de-sac where you do work with a group of other homeowners and you just go out and you buy things for the cul-de-sac. Is that really your responsibility? So asking the question, whose back does this monkey belong is an important one because it will clarify when you should spend and when you should pause. The next point is what I call the 24 hour rule. We all do this. We see something that we have to have and we take out the credit card to buy it instantly. Pause. If it's a big number, particularly pause, but pause, wait 24 hours. And if you still feel strongly about it, 
do a bit of research, read up on it, make sure that it is going to give you what you think it's going to give you, and only after you've done that, then you can proceed. By the way, half the time when someone waits for 24 hours, they don't want it the next day. The next rule is what I call the gas station and the next town rule. One of the most interesting aspects of living in New York is that you can get gas for a min-max of about 40%. If you buy it in one town, it's 40% less than the high end of another town. And in between, there are prices that are what would be considered average. But when gas is six or seven dollars a gallon, particularly in New York, and you can find it for $4.99 or $4.59 versus seven dollars, it makes sense to drive to the next town to buy the gas. Now, why does this happen? Well, two reasons. One, the gas station might be in a strategically located place where the affluent happen to drive through and they don't care as much about the price of gas. Or, and more likely, there's a tax difference from town to town. And that tax difference can be as much as a dollar, a dollar fifty a gallon. So when you're thinking about buying gas or anything, really extrapolated to anything that you want to buy, make sure that you are purchasing it at the right place because oftentimes you're not. The second point is engaging in simple negotiation. Don't worry, you're not going to be in a room with a light bulb dangling from the ceiling, staring down someone who's across the table from you. Simple negotiation is very easy to do and I'm going to show you how to do it in just a moment. I call this the Monty Hall rule, the let's make a deal rule for those of you who used to watch that game show, let's make a deal. The reason that simple negotiation is such an important skill is because in your everyday life, you're going to be faced with two types of purchases. Those that have no negotiation available, like grocery store items usually, and those that are highly negotiable, but people are afraid to do it. It's that second category which will make or break your retirement in many cases versus being able to discount a cantaloupe at the grocery store. So here's what I'm talking about. First, you need to know if it's something that you can negotiate because, as I said, a lot of prices cannot be negotiated. If it's on a shelf, it's usually not negotiable. You can try, of course. I've seen people do it. I've actually seen people do it successfully at the grocery store and other stores, but it's rare and it looks like the person is just having fun rather than trying to get a deal every single time. And just to point out the obvious, but I do need to say this, if someone is going to offer you an item for sale, they're not going to follow up with, by the way, this is a negotiable price, if it's a negotiable price. They want you to buy the biggest and most expensive item at the most expensive price. That's what they do. So you don't walk into a car dealership with the person on the other side of the table saying to you, the price is $2,000 down and $3.99 per month, but this is our starting price, so let's see if you can improve upon that. That just doesn't happen. So when the price is not obvious or it's confusing, like when you walk into a car dealership and you see the list of all of the add-ons plus all of the taxes below, that particular item is probably negotiable. They want more, you want to pay less. At some point, you'll reach a number. But understand how the game is played. If you're in the dealership, you're in the lion's den. And I use the lion's den as a figure of speech. It could be a car dealership, it could be a sales office at a timeshare, or it could be a sales office at an apartment complex. You get the point. You're at their place of business. How do you take away the home field advantage? You use the rule of three. How does the rule of three work? Before you ever walk into the lion's den, you call them on the telephone, you call them. Don't send them an email, call them and ask to speak to a salesperson. Tell them that you're going to buy a Chevy Cavalier today and somebody's going to get your business and know exactly what you're asking for. Ask them to give you a price over the phone. If they won't give it to you, then hang up and call the next Chevy dealer. Also tell them that you're going to hang up and call the next Chevy dealer and you're going to get a price. After making three phone calls, you're going to have three different prices. Each time you make the phone call, ask them at the end if that's their best possible price. They will tell you, generally speaking, that they would like the opportunity to requote if you get a better price. Tell them their best price is their final price right then and there, because if you give them the opportunity to price match, while it seems like a good idea and they'll tell you that they have the best service in town, in reality, they didn't give you the lowest price the first time. There are also some ethical issues around telling someone that you're going to give them the business if they give you the lowest possible price and then you don't give them the business even though they gave you the lowest possible price. You need to be ruthless on this last point. No final looks, no 
will match prices when you're talking to someone. Their best price is their only price. Let them know it's now or never. The rule of three works with cars, condos, boats, anything. Anything that is a large purchase item and is typically negotiated, this is the way to do it. It doesn't work in grocery stores, it doesn't work in department stores, it doesn't work in retail stores generally unless it's a specialty retail store like a jeweler. So if that's not what you're looking at, you have the opportunity to negotiate. The rule of three. The third important and probably the most important money skill in 2022 anyway is how to reduce the effects of inflation on your household. Inflation is upon us and frankly there's no end in sight. For the 12 month period ending February 2022, inflation was running at 7.9%. That means that if you paid a dollar for something a year ago, you pay a dollar eight for that same thing today. First, understand that 7.9% is an average. Some things will be higher, some things will be lower. Fuel, for example, is going to be a lot higher than 7.9% over the last 12 months, particularly and especially over the last few weeks, frankly. But also on the other end, something like a movie is not going to be up 7.9% in most cases. That 7.9% comes from the Consumer Price Index. It represents what's called a basket of goods that people typically buy. Now, how do you mitigate against this? First, understand what's not in the basket or what hasn't changed or changed much anyway. You can find out what the composition of the CPI items are. I'll put a link in the description below so that you can go to the CPI website and see what those are yourself. Now, assuming that what you have is on the list, there are some things that you can do. First, if you own a home and you're making payments on your home, then your payments won't be going up unless you have a mortgage that happens to be resetting around this time. So your mortgage payment is fixed. So your equivalent of housing costs hasn't gone up and it won't go up, fortunately. What will go up is taxes around your home. Taxes go up every year or two in many cases. Consider challenging a tax increase. If you've never done it before, you'd be surprised at how much overcharging municipalities do when it comes to taxes. Now, be careful when you do this, make sure that your municipality doesn't reset both ways. I've never heard of it happening, at least with people that I know, and I know a lot of people that have challenged their taxes successfully, but I have read about it happening in certain places. So check around before you engage in your tax challenge. Point number two, in a inflationary or hyperinflationary economy, make sure that you master point number one, efficient spending. If you don't need to buy it, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. I don't need to mention anything more about this because we discussed that in great detail earlier. Just remember that if it's efficient, then you need it. If it's effective, it just means that you got a good price. The next point is considering a fixed rate payment schedule with your utility provider. In this day and age, particularly with what's going on in Europe, there is a lot of risk that prices are going to continue up in anything that consumes fuel whether it's the power plant down the road, hopefully down the road many, many miles, or your car, costs are going to go up. Oftentimes, utility providers will offer you the option to fix in your payment for a certain period of time, 12, 18, even 24 months. This has the added advantage of protecting you against any more upside movement. At the same time, there's also a risk that you're going to be locking in at a price that you're going to have to pay for the next period of time and the actual price might be lower. So consider this one carefully. Also, if there's an alternative electricity provider who's basically an electricity broker, they buy wholesale and they sell it to the retail market, consider working with them as well. A lot of areas do have this available for them and those alternative electricity providers can provide you a good discount on the fuel that you're paying for, the electricity that you're paying for, more importantly, they too have fixed rate contracts. A lot of them do anyway. The next point is look for zero interest installment payments. This is very typical at universities. If you have a tuition payment that's due for a family member, you can either pay it all at one time or you can pay it out over three months with zero interest. If you have that option, particularly in an inflationary environment, it makes sense to take that option, assuming that you don't actually spend the money twice. Next point is providing the inputs that you would normally pay for yourself. 
A good example is gardening. If you have someone that comes and does your lawn and they're raising their prices, well, maybe it's time to buy a lawnmower and do it yourself. Whatever the input is, if you can do it yourself, the cost doesn't change very much, generally speaking. And true to form, this channel does not give investment advice, but there are certain investments that do well in an inflationary economy. Speak to a qualified financial advisor for those. Think things like construction, energy, utilities, etc. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you got a lot out of it. If you like this video and you want to see more of me, please make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications so that you get alerted the next time I post a video. I post about twice a week. Now more than ever, with the uncertainty in the world, information like this is vital. And I work very hard to get what's out there and here for you. This is Jeff Schmidt. Thanks for watching.